I suspect when you uh, heard the reading tonight, you thought, oh, great, another healing. Now, this is the ninth specific healing we've had in Luke. There's been quite a few others. Sometimes it says Jesus healed many, and we don't know how many that many is. But isn't it great that we have a God who can save, a God who can heal, a God who chooses to heal, a God who chooses to save us. But tonight, rather than thinking so much about the healing, I want us to think about the issue that came with this being done on the Sabbath. And I'm going to start by taking our minds to a 1981 film. Chariots of Fire won an Oscar because it tells a true story. It tells a true story of two athletes, Harold Abrahams, the man of the world, and Eric Little, a committed Christian. Now, for those of you who haven't seen it, those of you who haven't read the books, Eric Little was one of the favourites to win the gold medal for the 100 metres in the Paris Olympics of 1924. He was a man who'd gone on to be a missionary and eventually to die in a Japanese prisoner of war camp. But the quarter finals of the 100 metres was scheduled to be run on a Sunday. And Little made it his principle never to run on a Sunday, which he regarded as being of the utmost importance of the Lord's Day. So he pulled out of the 100 metres. His coach and other people, including even the Prince of Wales, tried to convince him to change his mind. But he was adamant that he wouldn't run a race on a Sunday. He believed that running a race on a Sunday would violate the fourth commandment, that is to keep the Sabbath day holy. But God honoured Little Stand to make Sunday a special day for him in a rather strange way. Having, been, having turned down the chance to run in 100 metres, his particular race, the one he was known as being a specialist in, he ended up running in the 400 metres final. But it was a race he'd never run before. Look at the verse that was given to him just before he ran. Those who honour me, I will honour. But those who despise me will be disdained. It's an interesting thing, isn't it? We've got the Olympics coming up this year. How many of our athletes would be prepared to stand by their convictions, by their faith, and not run a race that was on a Sunday? For Liddell, it was a really important thing, a statement that he made. And today's reading, the one we looked at in Luke, was challenging us, challenging the Jews, about what they believed was right or wrong to do on the, sun, the Sabbath. Now, I want to look at this passage in three ways tonight. It may seem we go back and repeat ourselves several times, but I'm going to try not to repeat the verses too often. But as we're going through the verses, remember we're going to be thinking about them in different ways. So let's start with the literal interpretation. So that's the bit we see as we read it, the bit we see as we're looking at it. So let's start with the very first verse we're looking at. On a Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues. Now, it doesn't tell us which synagogue. It doesn't tell us where it is. It doesn't tell us how many people are there. We don't know if it's a small church, a big church. It doesn't really matter. It's not important. But I think there's a principle here, because on the Sabbath, people went to the synagogue. They went there expecting to be taught and to listen to what was being said. And all the religious leaders also went there. But did they go to teach? Or were they going there to be seen, to be at the front, to be those important people they like to do? Now, in this country these days, perhaps it's not socially the norm to go to church, but in many of the areas of the world, America, Canada, it's socially the norm to go to a church. But I'd challenge those people and I'd say, actually, why are you going? Are you going along because it's socially the norm, or are you going because you want to meet God? Why are we at church? Are we here to meet God, or are we here because we want to be seen to be at church? So that sets the scene as what we're looking at tonight. But I want us to look at the two cripples who meet Jesus on this day. Some of you may be thinking, I only saw one cripple. But I believe there's actually two people we need to look at here. They're crippled in different ways. But we're going to start by looking at the first cripple. And that was the woman. Now as you look at this first, you'll see that it's not a new issue. It's not a new problem she's got. It says she'd been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. It wasn't a physical handicap, it was a spiritual handicap. She'd been attacked by a demon. Satan has held her in captivity, in bondage, for 18 years. So, like many of the other people that we've seen in previous passages of Luke, there's a healing that's required. But this time, the person isn't coming 
to Jesus to ask for healing, we see something quite important. Jesus takes the initiative. He sees her. He calls her forward. And he says to a woman, you are set free from your infirmity. Now it's interesting this, because as we read this, we see this healing is immediate. I want to come back to that immediacy later on when we're thinking about ourselves and about the church. So 18 years of this illness, this disease, this being crippled, is healed immediately by God. The other thing I want to point out is that the healing is real. It was a real miracle. She was really healed. And she went away from Jesus healed. There was no, oh, it would take time. There was no, in six months' time, a year's time, two years' time. It was immediate. And that, again, is like some of the other healings that we've looked at. But I mentioned there was two cripples. And the other one, I think, is the ruler of the synagogue. Now, it says that the ruler is indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. So the synagogue leader says to the people, there are six days for work, so come and be healed on those days, not on the Sabbath. I believe this man was crippled, crippled by a spirit of legalism, by the spirit of tradition, by habit. Instead of rejoicing that God had actually worked a miracle, he wasn't praising God, he wasn't thanking God, he was looking for the problems. Now, I guess the equivalent of a synagogue ruler today would be a pastor or a vicar. It's someone who people looked up to. So why did he decide to take issue with Jesus? There may well be several reasons, but I've got to admit, I think the major reason is because of the fact it was the Sabbath day. There was no issue with the fact that Jesus had actually healed the woman. That was clear to be seen. She'd walked away. People could see that. No one disputes here that Jesus' healing is from anywhere other than God. There's no counterclaims here that he was using the name of Satan or using wrong powers. No one's disputing it was a good thing to do. But it was the day that Jesus had chosen to perform the healing that caused the upset. He did that on the Sabbath, and the Pharisees had defined that as being work. Now, in today's society, I guess many people wouldn't even understand what the problem was with that. We've become used in our society to finding the shops open on a Sunday, sports events taking place on a Sunday. And perhaps some of those are actually fairly recent events. Certainly when I grew up, and despite what you youngsters may think, I'm not as old as some of the people over here. When I grew up, shops weren't open much on a Sunday. Certainly in my household, because I came from a fairly traditional background, we didn't have the television on, and on a Sunday I wouldn't be allowed out to go and play with my friends in the street. Perhaps, yeah, that probably even that's a strange idea for somebody playing in the street. But we didn't have many cars in those days either. And on a Sunday, you wouldn't be wearing your normal clothes. You wouldn't be out in the garden doing work. You'd have been in your Sunday best, and you'd been coming to church. Because it was the day for being with the Lord. And that isn't something this society is used to. And I think that puts different challenges and strains upon us as Christians when we're trying to be different in terms of being a Christian, but at the same time, not being legalistic about it. But I think particularly in Jesus' day, it was a really hot potato. And the reason for that is that Israel had been overrun by the Romans, and the Jews were probably struggling to keep their identity. Now, for them, their identity was very much bound up with the covenant that we find in the Old Testament. And they believed that only by keeping those rules absolutely rigidly could they satisfy God. So the issue for the rule of the synagogue was that by healing on the Sabbath... Jesus was breaking the fourth commandment. Set out in Exodus. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labour sev- and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. Now we need to come to what is a definition of work here. Jesus isn't being paid. He's not a doctor. He's actually just helping somebody. He's healing somebody. But as we've mentioned before, the Pharisees like to increase these rules by putting their own interpretations upon them. Some of these were quite pedantic. So, one example is that on the Sabbath, you could take an animal out to water, provided nothing was carried. So you could draw water out the well, you could put it into a trough, and the animal could drink it, and that was perfectly fine. However, if you actually held the bucket for the animal to drink from, that was considered to be work. 
if we think about healing, you could heal somebody if their life was in absolute danger. You could save a life, but you couldn't carry out normal medical practice just to alleviate suffering. Now, this woman's been ill for 18 years, as I said. So you can tell that this wasn't an immediate problem. It probably wasn't life-threatening at that point. And therefore, by healing her on the Sabbath, Jesus had broken that part of the rule. So that's why the uh, synagogue ruler is reacting the way he did. But then Jesus replies to him. And I think he's fairly hard. He starts by saying, you hypocrite. That's pretty harsh words. It's not the way to make friends and influence people. So why did he reply that way? I think it's because the synagogue ruler was standing there, holding himself up as being a really religious, an upright, a spiritual man, and yet he was flatly contradicting the spirit of God's laws. Because you see, it's the spirit of God's laws that counts sometimes, not the actual letter of it. Look at Jesus' reasoning as he replies to him. You hypocrites, doesn't each of you on the Sabbath untie your ox or donkey from the stall and lead it out to give water? Then should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for 18 long years, be set free on the Sabbath day? From what bound her? So he's saying, you know, you've got to look at what the purpose of the law is about, not the way you interpret it. He was abiding by the spirit of the law for animals, but abiding by the letter of the law for people. It's easy for some of us, perhaps those of us who are older, to get caught up in our own traditions, our own rituals, our own habits. You may think, actually, in this enlightened day, we're not so bound up. We're used to shops being open. We're used to people doing different things. I mentioned earlier on about wearing Sunday best. Now, I've got to be honest. If I turn up to church in jeans and trainers and a T-shirt, I actually don't feel that comfortable. I'm not used to that. To me, I'm coming to meet the King of Kings. I like to be despite the way I look, reasonably smart. Do I look down on people who are wearing jeans and T-shirts? No, I don't, because it's not what's on the outside that's important. It's what people are like on the inside. That's what God's looking at. So me turning up, not turning up in my jeans, but turning up in a shirt and trousers, is that a tradition? Is it a ritual? Is it something that cripples me? Is it something that gets in my way? I'd like to think it isn't, but I'd have to think about it. I'd have to challenge myself. Another example, my friends and family were recently on a holiday in Italy. It's a Christian holiday, local, local contact was there. We met him a number of years ago, and he was talking about the little church he was going to, an evangelical church that was reaching out to Italy, a place that's full of Roman Catholics, but struggling with Christianity. And four or five years ago, he was talking about how the church was growing. They were getting new people coming in week after week after week to hear the gospel, getting saved, getting their lives converted. We met him again this year, and this time he was talking about a split in the church, about the church dwindling, about people dropping out from the church. It's caused by a new pastor, a pastor who's come in and has been insisting that all women who come to church must wear veils. If you, can't, if you don't wear a veil, you're not allowed through the front door. Now, he's basing that in Corinthians. But that, to me, is an example of a man-made rule getting in the way of God's work. I find it really sad to see a church that was growing, dwindling, suffering, because of one person bringing in rules that are man-made. But there's a challenge for us here, isn't there, about how we look at our church, how we look at our traditions. Now, legalism is heavy. It's usually a killjoy. But if you look at the fruits of the Spirit, they're very different. Look at Galatians 5 and 22. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, Peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, and faithfulness. You know, the Christian life is supposed to be joyful. Jesus said, I've come to give you life, that you might live it to its full abundance. The woman went away rejoicing. The synagogue ruler didn't go away rejoicing. He didn't go away praising God. But it's quite interesting, when we get to the end of our passage, what do we find? Everyone else is happy apart from his opponents, apart from the rulers, apart from the Pharisees. They missed out on the blessings of God. So what I would say to us is that we mustn't put up on necessary barriers. So having gone through a very quick look at the verses on a surface level, I want us then to look at another interpretation of this passage. 
I call this the prophetic interpretation. Now this time, I want you to think of the woman in the passage that we read about as actually being the church. And therefore, the question I'm trying to challenge us with, and I'm not going to give you all the answers, but I want you to go away and think about it, is in today's church, in the church in the UK, in the church in the world, in the church in Cow Plain, what kind of infirmities are there that are preventing us being useful to God? You see, in Revelations, we read the letters to the churches. And one of them, in Revelation 3 and 14, is writing to the church in Laodicea. The church in Laodicea is a church that's based in a really prosperous city. It's famous for its wealth. It had a big clothing industry. And it had, interestingly enough, eye powder. Now, there's some just arguments as to whether that was a, a medical treatment you put into your eye to improve it, or whether it was some kind of decoration. But it was a very wealthy city. But what did the church there get accused of? This is what Jesus tells John to write. I know your deeds, that you're neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you're lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. That's pretty harsh, isn't it? But I wonder if the church had become comfortable, it become relaxed, it was fairly well off, it didn't have many you know, poor people to deal with. There can't be any real Christianity without enthusiasm. We've got a mission coming up, Connect 16, Phil was mentioning it earlier on. We need to be enthusiastic about it. It's no good thinking, oh, it'll be all right, we'll get through it, we'll muddle through. We need people to be committed to it. You know, the Bible talks for us about three spiritual states. There are those with a burning heart who are on fire for God. Think about the disciples in the road to Emmaus, what they had to say. Were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us? Now, you know, for many of us, we've got comfortable being Christians. We've got, many of us have become comfortable in our lives, coming to church on a regular basis. There's a challenge for us. How often do we walk out of here with our hearts burning? Then you've got those who've got a cold heart. Because of the increase in wickedness, the love of most will grow cold to Jesus in Matthew. And then, as we've been reminded, there's those with the lukewarm heart. And it was this last state of the church that caused it to be of no use to God. The lukewarm church is a church that's indifferent to the things of God. It's a church that's indifferent to the things of the gospel. It's indifferent to the fact of the people who are not saved. It's not worried about the thousands, the millions outside who don't know God as saviour. You can either be for God or you're against God. There is no middle ground on this. And if you're for God, you're tasked with the need to go out and preach his gospel to save souls. So they were a lukewarm church. They were also quite a wealthy church, as I've said. When material wealth is placed above spiritual concerns, the church becomes bent over, it becomes crippled. This was a church where their spiritual condition was the exact opposite of their material position. They were very well off, but they had no real love for God. They got what they wanted, but they'd lost what they needed. And the result was they became wretched, miserable, Pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. As I said before, this was a, a city that was famous for its clothing. They're being described as naked. It was famous for its eye powder. They're being described as blind. I wonder if our church is like that sometimes. Are we neither hot nor cold? We lost our vigour for Christ. Are we concerned about being comfortable, spending our money being comfortable, concerned about our wealth, what we're doing with our money, rather than using it for God? And perhaps more importantly, have we become blind? Have we lost our vision about what God wants us to be doing? See, when Jesus saw her, this crippled woman, he called her forward. And that is true for you as a person, and more importantly for us as a church, for all churches. That no matter what it is that's crippling us, what's hindering us, Jesus can overrule that, he can heal that, he can take that away. He called her forward, he set us free. He sets the church free as well. And we find that also in Revelation, because that church, the Lady Sin Church, he says, those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline, so be earnest and repent. 
Jesus is going to bring his church back to him. Because that's one of his tasks. Because do you know what he wants to do? He wants to turn this into a church that's fit and proper for him. He wants to make the church holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present us to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Now, I don't know about you. He's got a lot of work to do in me before I can get to that point. But I want you to notice something else. Yes, we've got to be open there. But as we saw in this passage, Jesus takes initiative. And in the very next verse in Revelation, he says this, a very famous verse. Many of you have looked at the uh, Holman Hunt's picture of this. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person, and they with me. But if you've looked at that painting, you'll have noticed that there is no latch on the door on the outside. Only the person on the inside can unlock it, can open it. So what I want to say to you is, yes, Jesus will take the initiative. He's calling you, he's calling us into, as individuals and as a church, but we've got to be the ones to say, yes, take us and use us. So, we've looked at it as a literal interpretation, we looked at it as prophetic, and now we come to the personal interpretation. So, in this time, I want you to think of the lady who's crippled as being you, me, us. What kind of infirmities is it that causes us to be bent over and of no use to God? Perhaps we grumble and we murmur and we mumble in the background. Do we have a whinge about someone else in the church? We didn't like the music, we didn't like the way he spoke, we didn't like the way he read. Oh, I wish they wouldn't always sit in that seat. We didn't like the coffee, we didn't like the tea. It's very easy to do it, isn't it? You know, it happens all the way through scripture. The Israelites are a pretty classic example of this, aren't they? So they travelled through the wilderness, they constantly complained about one thing or another. They complained about the leadership. In the desert, the, grum- the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. They complained about the lack of food and water. Here's Jesus rescuing them from slavery. Sorry, God rescuing them from slavery. And they're moaning and complaining. So they say, what are we going to drink? What are we going to eat? They even complained about the terrain they were going through. Was it because there were no graves in Egypt you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done by bringing us out of Egypt? A certain monastery enforced a vow of silence. Each monk could utter only two words every five years. And those two words had to be spoken to the abbot. One of the monks hadn't been there very long. When given his opportunity to speak, he said, bad food. Five years later, his two words were, hard bed. When given his third opportunity another five years later, he said, I quit. Well, said the abbot, you might as well. You've done nothing but complain since you got here. I wonder, how often do we come to church looking for the issues, looking for the problems, looking for the things that we're not going to like, rather than coming here to focus our eyes upon God and what he's got to say to us? How often do we walk out the door thinking, well, it was all right sermon, but actually the bit I didn't like was when he did so and so. How many of us come here actually wanting to meet with God and walk out in a positive frame of mind? Philippians 2.14 says this, do everything without grumbling or arguing. And that can be a real challenge to us, can't it? You know, we sit there and we think, oh, do I really want to do that? Have I really got to go to the quiz night? Have I really got to be involved with the Connect 16? Can't somebody else do it? But, you know, complaining does two things. It demonstrates a lack of gratitude for what God has done for us in the past. And boy, hasn't he done a lot for us. And it also demonstrates a lack of confidence in what God's going to do for us. One of the discussions I've had at work a few times is the fact that people say, well, I can't really comprehend God, I don't understand. I don't understand how you say you can do these things. To be honest, I'm not sure I'd want to believe in a God that I could understand and fully comprehend. I want a God who's pretty miraculous, don't you? Or perhaps it's that we're selfish. Philippians 1.21, Paul writes this, For me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Yet in the very same book, he writes this. For everyone looks out for their own interests and not those of Jesus Christ. Where do you think we fit? Are we people looking out for Christ? 
or any people who are living our lives on what I would call the church buffet plan, where it's self-service. Or perhaps we're just a little bit lazy at times. We don't want to get too involved, don't want to work too hard. I'm not saying we shouldn't have rest. But, you know, some people stand on the promises of God. Other people are just sitting in the premises. Laziness can be something that the devil uses to really hinder us. We've been saved for a purpose. That purpose is to do God's work on this earth and to glorify him and to be with him forever. One of the ways we do that is by being involved. That can be in the church. It can be out in the wider community. It's promoting his word, being his gospel. Once upon a time, there were four neighbours. Fred, somebody. Thomas, everybody. Pete, anybody. And Joe, nobody. They all belonged to the same church, but they were quite odd people, actually. And you probably wouldn't have understood them. And believe me, although they all went to the same church, you wouldn't have wanted to go there to worship with them. Everybody went fishing on, Saturday, on Sunday, or sometimes stayed at home and visited friends. Anybody wanted to worship, but was afraid that somebody wouldn't speak to him, so nobody went to church. Now, actually, nobody was the only decent person out the four. Nobody did the visitation. Nobody worked on the church building. Once they needed a Sunday club teacher. Everyone thought that anybody would do it, and somebody thought that everybody would teach. And guess who did it? That's right, absolutely nobody. It happened that an unbeliever moved into the neighbourhood. Everybody thought that somebody would win him to Christ. Anybody could have made an effort. But nobody actually won him to Christ. Laziness can be a big hindrance. We need to challenge ourselves about what it is we're doing for God. Are we doing the right things? Are we doing it in the right way? It doesn't matter how long you've been in a routine of doing things, and some of us have been in the church for a long time. This woman had been crippled for 18 years. She was bent over, couldn't straighten up at all. 18 years of that. But God didn't give up on her. Sometimes the Lord will have to let us go until we come to the end of ourselves. So much time is wasted if that's the case, isn't it? If you can sit there and honestly challenge yourself, think about what it is you do and what you don't do, then you can come to Christ and ask him to heal you. Remember his words to the woman. He said, you are set free. Jesus has the power to set us free from whatever is crippling us, whatever that is. Look what it said in 2 Timothy. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. So you know when I've been standing up here, I like to try and think of a way of applying it to us. And I've got to be honest, today I'm only going to leave you with three questions, things for you to think about. So these are my three questions. First of all, I want to start with differences. What do you think the difference was between Jesus healing on the Sabbath and little running a race on the Sabbath, on a Sunday? Was it the fact that both were listening to God but being called to do different things? What is the difference that people see in you, be it on a Sunday or be it during the week? Don't get me wrong, I don't think we should be sitting in holy huddles, never going out the door, never meeting with other people, but I do think they should see something different in our lives. My next question is, what is crippling today's church? Now, I'm thinking of this because we live in a society where attendance at church, generally speaking, is dropping. Why is it the church isn't being affected? So that's the general thing about the UK. Is this church being affected? What are we doing right? What are we doing wrong? We've got to be honest. We've got to seek God's will. We've got to know if we're doing the right things. As leaders, it's something we constantly seek for. But actually, it should be all of you praying for that as well. The church isn't this building. The church is you. Each one of you needs to be playing your part in it. And then lastly, there's a question for each of us about what is actually crippling us. What is it that holds us back? Is it work? Is it family? Is it outside interests? 
Is it wanting to go to the cinema? Is it wanting to go to football matches? Is it wanting to drive a bigger car? There can be all kinds of things that get in the way. But when we look at this passage about Jesus healing a woman on the Sabbath, it's not about the actual healing. It's about our attitude as to what we're doing for God. And that is something we need to think about and pray about. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we know that you've given us life. You came down to this earth to give us freedom and release for legalism. And Father, we want to ask that we, as individuals and as a church, will draw closer to you to know your will and your guidance. That, Lord, the example we set in the community will be one that reflects you and not our own ideas, our own interpretations. Lord, for those of us who've known you for many years, we get into routines, we get into habits, we get into traditions. But Lord, we ask that during this coming week, you'll speak to each of us about what it is we do and what we don't do. The things we do before you and the things we do despite you. Lord, challenge us, bring us close to you. Let us know you as our true and living God, that we can bring you the right worship and honour and glory in this neighbourhood in which we live. Lord, use us as individuals, use us as a church to bring your gospel home to people who need to know you as their saviour.